Hello and welcome to another episode of Unworthy History. Here on this channel we talk about actual history that isn't worthy of TV channels like the History Channel. Now today I'm recording this at Sunday, uh, March 27th, uh, 2022, and this is actually the 186th anniversary of the Goliad Massacre uh, that also occurred on a Sunday, March 27th. It was Palm Sunday. Uh, back in 1836. So I'm going to read about that uh, massacre from this book uh, right here. Uh, so this was a book that was published in 1855, so a very early history of Texas, uh, written by Henderson K. Yocum. Uh Now, you know, this uh, the Goliad Massacre was kind of the other thing that uh, really motivated the Texians at the Battle of San Jacinto. They said, remember the Alamo and remember Goliad. Uh, but unfortunately, um, I looked at the History Channel's lineup today, and they're not showing anything related to you know that or any other history. So they're, they're going to have Pawn Stars on, and then they're going to focus later, I guess, on what they call the history of food. So they're going to talk about the food that built America. And then there's a show later on called Adam Eats the 80s. And that sounds about, uh, it's about as dumb of a name of a show as I've ever heard. Uh, so here on this channel, I'm going to talk about actual history. <clears throat> this is something uh, that was going on in the, during the Texas Revolution. And I think it's important uh, to just keep the history alive of that time uh, and really of any time period, something that uh, unfortunately the History Channel doesn't do. So this is uh, starting, I'm going to start right here. This is when, uh, after Colonel Fannin's troops had been, hey, had been captured, and they had been surrounded and then taken back to Goliad after they had been captured. And then a few other uh, regiments, smaller regiments, were also captured, uh, say, coming in from the coast or something like that. And so in total, there were about 450 or so prisoners uh, at Goliad. And then uh, Santa Ana... Um, he ordered them to be executed. The prisoners thought they would be tr uh, treated as prisoners of war and basically deported back to the United States. Uh, but instead, Santa Ana, under a policy that he had just put in in 1835, which basically allowed him to kill anyone who opposed him, uh, he said that any rebels would be treated like pirates uh, and that they could summarily be executed. The evening of the 26th passed off pleasantly enough. Colonel Fannin was entertaining his friends with the prospect of returning to the United States, and some of the young men who could perform well on the flute were playing Home Sweet Home. How happy we are that the veil of the future is suspended before us. At 7 o'clock that night, an order brought by an extraordinary courier from Santa Ana required the prisoners to be shot. Detailed regulations were sent as to the mode of executing this cold-blooded and atrocious order. <clears throat> Colonel Portilla, the commandant of the place, did not long hesitate in its execution. He had 445 prisoners under his charge, 80 of these brought from Copano, having just landed and who as yet had done no fighting were considered as not within the scope of the order, and for the time were excused. <clears throat> The services of four of the Texas physicians, that is, Dr. Joseph H. Bernard, Dr. Field, Dr. Hall, and Shackelford, being needed to take care of the Mexican wounded, their lives were spared as well. So likewise were four others who were assistants in the hospital. At dawn of day on Palm Sunday, March 27th, the Texans were awakened by a Mexican officer who said he wished them to form a line that they might be counted. The men were marched out in separate divisions under different pretexts. Some were told that they were to be taken to Capano in order to be sent home. Others that they were going out to slaughter beeves. And others, again, that they were being removed to make room in the fort for Santa Ana. Dr. Shackelford, who had been invited by Colonel Gurrier to his tent about a hundred yards southeasterly from the fort, says, In about half an hour we heard the report of a volley of small arms toward the river and to the east of the fort. I immediately inquired the cause of the firing and was assured by the officer that he did not know but supposed it was the guard firing off their guns. In about 15 or 20 minutes thereafter, another such volley was fired, directly south of us and in front. 
At the same time, I could distinguish the heads of some of the men through the buffs of the peach trees and could hear their screams. It was then for the first time the awful conviction seized upon our minds that treachery and murder had begun their work. Shortly afterward, Colonel Guerriere appeared at the t mouth of the tent. I asked him if it could be possible they were murdering our men. He replied that it was so, but he had not given the order, neither had he executed it. In about an hour more, the wounded were dragged out and butchered. Colonel Fannin was the last to suffer. When informed of his fate, he met it like a soldier. He handed his watch to the officer whose business it was to murder him and requested him to have him shot in the breast and not in the head, and likewise to see that his remains should be decently buried. These natural and proper requirements the officer promised should be fulfilled, but with perfidy he failed to do either. Fannin seated himself in a chair, tied the handkerchief over his eyes, and bared his bosom to receive the fire of the soldiers. As the different divisions were brought to the place of execution, they were ordered to sit down with their backs to the guard. In one instance, young Fenner rose on his feet and exclaimed, Boys, they are going to kill us. Die with your faces to them like men. At the same moment, two other young men, flourishing their caps over their heads, shouted at the tops of their voices, Hurrah for Texas! Many attempted to escape, but most of those who survived the first fire were cut down by the pursuing cavalry or afterward shot. It is believed that in all, 27 of those who were marched out to be slaughtered made their escape, leaving 330 who suffered death on that Sunday morning. The dead were then stripped and their naked bodies thrown into piles. A few brush were placed over them and an attempt made to burn them up, but with such poor success that their hands and feet and much of their flesh were left to prey for dogs and vultures. <clears throat> Texas has erected no monument to perpetuate the memory of these heroic victims of a cruel barbarism, yet they have a memorial in the hearts of their countrymen more durable than brass or marble. Now this was written, of course, in 1855, but uh, I think by now uh, there have been some, uh, there are some monuments there. Colonel Fannin doubtless erred in postponing for four days the obedience to the order of the commander-in-chief to retreat with all possible despatch to Victoria on the Guadalupe, and also in sending out Lieutenant Colonel Ward in search of Captain King. But these errors sprang from the noblest feelings of humanity, first in an attempt to save from the approaching enemy some Texan settlers at the mission of Refugio, and again in an endeavor to rescue King and his men at the same place, and finally to save Ward and his command until all was lost but honor. The public vengeance of the Mexican tyrant, however, was satisfied. Deliberately and in cold blood, he had caused 330 of the sternest friends of Texas, her friends while living and dying, to tread the wine press for her redemption. He chose the Lord's day for his sacrifice. It was accepted, and God wa waited his own good time for retribution, a retribution which brought Santa Ana a trembling coward to the feet of the Texan victors, whose magnanimity prolonged his miserable life to waste the land of his birth with anarchy and civil war. So that was the account uh, of the battle of, uh, or the execution, the massacre of Goliad uh, from Henderson K. Yoakum's History of Texas, Volume 2. Uh, so this is an excellent original uh, history book, one of the earliest uh, histories of Texas. Uh, and I definitely recommend uh, it for anyone interested in, you know, learning more details about this time period. Uh, so anyhow, you know, I thought uh, this is a rather somber uh, episode. It's, uh, you know, not something to be uh, celebrated at all. Uh, fortunately for Santa Ana, um, Houston, you know, delivered more mercy on him than uh, Santa Ana had delivered on these 330 uh, prisoners that he had executed in cold blood. Um, so we'll talk more about uh, other episodes uh, of Texas history uh, on this program. So if you uh, want to hear more like this, then be sure to like and subscribe. And we'll see you next time on Unworthy History.